Welcome. I'm Timothy Jones. I'm the new rector at St. John's Episcopal Church. I'm glad for this opportunity we have to gather by means of technology when we cannot be together in person. I'm going to share a prayer, read the gospel reading for today, the third Sunday in Lent, and then share some reflections. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob, Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket." And the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water, gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Just then, Jesus' disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, What do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? The Gospel of the Lord. May all that is said and all that is heard be in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. What an unexpected turn of events. A few weeks ago, I wouldn't have dreamed that we'd have a situation that would keep us from worship this Sunday and next Sunday. It's hard for me. Worship, the stateliness, the beauty, the richness, the depth of Episcopal worship is what drew me into the Episcopal Church from another denomination some, de some decades ago. It grieves me for us not to be together, even while I acknowledge that not meeting is the right thing to do for this moment, for the long-term good that we will reap. 
Today's gospel reading is full of the unexpected. It has all the earmarks of a compelling story. It has some surprises. Now for a story to keep you engaged, you always have a character who needs something or goes after something but encounters some obstacles. Those complications in the storyline set up a tension and the tension, our need to know how our character gets out of a jam, that's what hooks us, makes us want to know more, makes us want to keep reading or keep watching if it's a movie that we're watching at home or at the theater. And it's true for stories we tell at family gatherings too or around the, the coffee pot or the water cooler at work. For that very reason, John, the gospel writer, writer is a great storyteller. And Jesus, the central character of John's gospel, wherever he went, left compelling stories in his wake. I mean, meeting him wasn't as simple as at first you might think. Nicodemus, the wealthy and influential religious leader, discovered that in last week's gospel reading. Nicodemus had seen, yes, Jesus is a miracle worker, a wise teacher, but his surprise in discovering how Jesus is more drives that story's momentum. And maybe there's a surprise in our meeting with Jesus, a surprise for us too. Now it's common in John's gospel that the people who may meet Jesus get surprised by who he is, sometimes caught off guard. The woman at the well, and Samaria, in our reading, found that. In her conversation with Jesus, the Samaritan woman starts off not even knowing who she's talking to. She's skeptical, even a little scoffing. We don't know, but will she too, like Nicodemus, encounter in him a way that will change everything? Her encounter starts normally enough. She comes out of the city to draw Water from the well, Jesus sits by a well in Samaria in the heat of the midday sun, tired from his journey. Alone, because his disciples had gone into the city to buy food, but there's something, something odd here. Wells in that region didn't have buckets attached. Travelers always carried soft, foldable leather buckets to draw water, but Jesus doesn't have his. Maybe Jesus deliberately sits by the well without a bucket. He's situating himself to be in need, in need of whoever appears with the necessary bucket and maybe thereby spark a transforming conversation. That's pretty shrewd. Well, a woman approaches, of course, odd though it is. It's midday under the hottest sun. The town's other women got water at the main well in the morning, while it was cooler, but she didn't. Did she come to this well on the outskirts during this odd time because those more respectable women shamed her, shunned her? And we see an obstacle right away, social distinctions that have to be overcome. She says to Jesus, how is it that you, a Jew, ask, of, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? She refers, of course, to the centuries of bad blood between Jews and Samaritans. But there's also her reputation that stands in the way. Soon she finds she's been married five times and now lives with a sixth man without being married. You can imagine, says one writer, a scenario of serial rejections, multiple failures, year by year, her accumulating wounds and scars in mind and body. For her to be near a man is to be near danger. Her guard is up and she pushes back at Jesus. It's not looking promising. All kinds of conventions are being broken here. There's lots of reasons for this congregation, for this conversation to come to a dead stop or what could be an encounter to go sour. And there are obstacles from Jesus' side, too. Jesus is breaking the social taboo that says that a rabbi never talks to a woman who is not his wife or sister or mother in public. A strange man was not even to make eye contact with a woman in a public, public place. 
And did you know that Jews and Samaritans did not drink out of the same vessels? Vessels Jesus could have been considered defiled by drinking from her bucket. But race, social standing, religious credentials apparently are no barriers, not for Jesus. Now, the disciples seemed shocked when they returned from getting food. A rabbi's reputation would be ruined for talking to the likes of her. But Jesus knows that more is at stake here than social convention. He's asked her for water, but it seems like he did so more so he could talk about the water that he has to offer, living water, forgiveness, his healing grace. It sounds good. But her obstacles persist. Her own sense of pride, her spiritual self-assurance gets in the way. Samaritans were proud of the well that tradition said went back to the time of Jacob himself, the great patriarch. Jesus, though, seems to be suggesting that water, that that well is not enough. Her defenses could go up even more. But now the woman makes a request. She softens. She says, give me this water. Things seem to be progressing, but she's about to meet an even greater threat to their encounter. For Jesus speaks honestly about her life. He lays bare her desperate situation, her sin. Nothing in this encounter has had greater potential to drive a wedge. For Jesus now has gone to the biggest threat of all to a pleasant outcome of this conversation. He's gone to her shame, not her nationality, not her gender, not even her immorality, but her embarrassment at her failings. Will her pride, wounded though it is, make her dismiss Jesus? Or will her shame make her shrink back? How will she respond? The invitation of one, the one she meets this afternoon. Soon she'll say, I met a man who told me everything I've ever done. What a phrase. I've been thinking about it all week. He told me everything I've ever done. Her skepticism melts into amazement. Her thirst for living water, her longing for an encounter with the living God seems to overcome all of her hesitation. She realizes nothing matters more. The woman didn't run away in tears to hide. She didn't cover her face in shame. She went running back to her village, maybe practically skipping for joy, and she spreads the word. Come and see, she says. Come meet the one who brought me out of darkness, out of the darkness of shame, and brought the light of new life. When Jesus shines a light on what's wrong in our lives, doesn't do it to make us despair. Speaking of the virus, speaking of the virus we're experiencing, C.S. Lewis, the great thinker from the 20th century, once spoke of Christ's coming as something with news that was bound to spread. Jesus, he said, came into this world and became a human being in order to spread to other people the kind of life he has. By what I call, Lewis says, a good infection. But there's one more question to answer. One more unresolved tension that comes from, that comes from this story. One, one more question to bring the story to closure. And it has to do with us. Where are we as we listen? Will pride Make us think we have no need of the refreshing water of Jesus' presence? Or will our shame, our disappointment, or our deficiencies make us retreat into private little worlds of regret? We could find our tears and our fears and our guilt met with the presence of the living Christ, our thirst answered by what he offers. We could. The question hangs in the air. The tension lingers. We could, but will we?